aren't necessarily wrong burdens, cares, and concerns. Um, in fact, somebody who's completely carefree, you might wonder, have they ever been faithful with any responsibility that God's given them? Uh, but I did use those terms because those are all synonyms. And in fact, even good and godly concerns and burdens and cares can become idolatry in our lives and can distract us and cut us off from joy in Christ. Um, these worries, anxieties, cares, concerns, burdens, pick your, pick your term there, they weigh down on us, they beg for attention, and our response to them, ladies, inevitably proves our theology. So in the normal flow of your life, your response to your um, burdens and concerns and anxieties prove your true theology. Your true theology comes out and it's on display in your response and your reaction to those things. And, 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 I, and I get it. There, there are so many things. There are landmines out there of elements that would pose a threat to you uh, that could become potential temptations to fear and anxiety. You might be asking questions about your own fulfillment, your own success, your own satisfaction on any given day. Will I be fulfilled today? Will I accomplish what I've planned? Will I fill out and check off every box on my mental day planner today? Or will today be a failure? Will I have interruptions? Will I be able to minimize those interruptions? How are the kids going to respond? And so on and so forth. You might have anxieties and concerns and burdens with regard to a relationship. Maybe with your, your husband, you might be asking, am I truly helping? Am I being truly godly? Am I truly serving? Am I interesting enough? Am I compelling enough? You might have worries and burdens and anxieties about your children. Will they be successful? Do they need more training? Are, are they lazy? Are they going to inherit all of my weaknesses and limitations? Are they going to be popular? Can I minimize the pain and suffering that they might face in life? And those, of course, are, are, are ones that certainly could be common to, uh, to a mom and to a, a wife and, and to a woman. And those also could obviously be common to any of us in the church. I mean, as a dad, uh, my fears and anxieties might tend to take on a different manifestation, but fear and anxiety is, of course, a, is not a gender-specific sin. Uh, you know, sometimes we joke about, uh, you know, mama bear coming out when it comes to uh, protecting her kids. Well, I kind of know a little bit about mama bear myself. I remember one time one of my children was, um, you know, had, we had a birthday party, and, and this child, uh, we, we, invited, we invited his friends over, and I remember being so excited about just celebrating this kid's fifth birthday with his friends, and then I walked out after preparing all this stuff and activities, and we're getting ready to do the cake, and, and there he is with all of his friends, and I was putting them in quotes because I'm already just seething. Just kidding, I'm not seething. I've gotten over it. And really, I've gotten over it. And all of his friends were on top of the monkey bars, spitting at him on his fifth birthday. And I remember just, okay, I know you're not supposed to discipline other people's kids, but today is the exception. <laughs> I, <laughs> no, I didn't do that. I wouldn't do that. I just spit in their cake to get, at, get back at them. But I, you know, I, I just remember like this, this, fear and, and just this, and, and this, this worry, and, and of course, maybe it's a more masculine, or maybe it's just a personality trait, just the, that that fear and anxiety starts to manifest itself in frustration and anger, or maybe it manifests itself in fear and anxiety and timidity. Maybe you have anxieties and fears about health, finances, in-laws, your role in the church, in the home, I mean, I'm just, this, we are barely scratching the surface. And if, I were, if it was my job to list out every particular trigger that you might be facing on any, any given week, one day wouldn't be long enough. But you understand where I'm going with that. That's what we're facing. And this first session, what I want to do is, we're going to look at a passage in the, in the Gospel of Matthew from the Sermon on the Mount. And so you can grab your Bibles and make your way there. We're going to get there in just a second. We're not, we're not going to quite there yet. But as, as I introduce why we're going to Matthew 6, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' instruction on anxiety, I want to ask the question, um, what's so wrong with anxiety? What's so wicked about it? Why is it so bad? And of course, that's a, in one way, that's a very simple answer. Why is it so bad? Because, it, because God hates it. Because it's a sin against God's character. It's a lie against God. That's why it's so wicked. Jesus says, do not worry. So ladies, 
You cannot worry without sinning against your God. It's impossible. That's the short answer. But before we get to the fuller answer that Jesus gives us in Matthew 6, I want to ask another question as well to kind of appreciate Matthew 6. I want you ladies to be able to appreciate Matthew 6 afresh because for, for probably a good number, probably a good majority of you ladies, this, this Matthew 6 passage is, is very familiar. And so before we dive in, I, I want to... I want to answer one more question to help you appreciate the freshness and, the, and the, the power of what Jesus does here in Matthew 6. And I want to ask this question. Why are we so prone to think lightly about anxiety? I, I, I just, I just ne it never ceases to amaze me how, how many buffers and, and barriers there are in my brain and in my mind to downplay anxiety and to downplay worry and I thought of, I was thinking about that this week, and I, I, listed out, I listed out a bunch of reasons, and then I just edited them out because some of them were, you know, not helpful. But I just kind of boiled it down to five. Five reasons why we are so prone to minimize and downplay anxiety. Number one, because of its acceptance in the culture. Anxiety is accepted in the culture. It's accepted on a, on a massive scale. Um, in 2006, it was estimated that 10% of Americans suffered from anxiety disorders. In 2021, it's estimated that this number is 18.1%. That's only, what is that, 15 years? 15 year time span? Now, d does that really mean that one fifth of our population is now anxious, whereas only 15 years prior it was just one tenth of our population? Have we become that much more anxious as a society? No, the heart of man does not change. There's no difference between the heart of man in 2006 and the heart of man in 2021. What changed was the diagnosis and the indicators of what qualifies as a mental disorder. <laughs> Anxiety is just becoming so increasingly broad and so increasingly accepted that it's actually becoming the norm. PsychologyToday.com had an article called, Anxiety is the most common of all mental illnesses. Um... For what it's worth, let me give you this. This will be uh, kind of a little uh, introduction to um, popular level, secular level diagnosis of anxiety. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association, APA, they write um, every few years, they come out with a new diagnostics and statistics manual. That's the, that's the Bible. That's the virtual Bible of psychiatry. And uh, going back to 1980, you were at the DSM-3, and then they had a revision of that, then the 4, and then the 5, and now we're at the 5, and that came out in 2013. So these, these editions have just been changing and changing. Well, here's a list of disorders pertaining to anxiety, fear, and panic listed in, this is in the, the 4, so this is back in the, 19, in the, 2000, uh, oh, sorry, the 1994 edition. Here's the list of uh, disorders contained in that section. Panic disorder without agoraphobia. Panic disorder with agoraphobia. Agoraphobia without history of panic disorder. Specific phobia, social phobia. Obsessive compulsive disorder. Post-traumatic st stress disorder. Acute stress disorder. Generalized anxiety disorder. Anxiety disorder due to a m general medical condition. Sustenance in, uh, I'm sorry, substance. Well, maybe, maybe there should be one, sustenance induced. Substance induced anxiety disorder. Anxiety disorder not otherwise specified. And so that's fairly comprehensive. Except when 19, 2013 rolled around, the DSM-5 separated all the anxiety ones from the ones involving other circumstances, especially the, tr the trauma ones. And so now they have just this in a very tightly uh, knit section. And so now in the anxiety disorder section, it's this, separation anxiety disorder, selective mutism, specific phobia, social anxiety disorder, uh, panic disorder, panic attack specifier, agoraphobia, generalized anxiety disorder, substance slash medication induced anxiety disorder, anxiety disorder due to another medical condition, other specified anxiety disorder, and unspecified anxiety disorder. I think that should get it until DSM-6 comes out, and I'm sure it'll be even more comprehensive. We, we, are, we, are, we live in a society 
that is increasingly defining anxiety disorder in broader and broader and broader terms. And so you take the same heart of man in 2006, the same heart of man in 2021, and of course, lo and behold, anxiety disorders have doubled. Not that anything's changed, but the diagnosis of it have actually doubled. I read a book by uh, Alan Francis who chaired the DSM-3 and the DSM-4. He taught um, psychiatry at Duke University. And um, he kind of blew the whistle a little bit on what's happening in the American Psychiatric Association. And he describes, he describes a banquet that he went to as kind of like the uh, former head of this whole project as it's being passed to the DSM-5 committee. And so he goes to this, you know, uh, really fancy banquet, and he's walking around seeing his old friends, and, and he's talking to these old, you know, experts in the psychiatric world who are diagnosing anxiety and fear, and he says, he says that um, he soon discovered that he personally qualified for many of the new disorders that were being suggested by them for inclusion in the DSM-5. My gorging on the delectable shrimp and ribs was, DSM-5, binge eating disorder. My forgetting names and faces uh, would be covered by DSM-5 minor neurocognitive disorder. My worries and sadness were going to be missed anxiety slash depressive disorder. The grief I felt at that my wife died was major depressive disorder. My well-known hyperactivity and distractibility were clear signs of, quote, adult attention deficit disorder. An hour of amiable chatting with old friends, and I had already acquired, acquired five new DSM diagnoses. And let's not forget my six-year-old identical twin grandsons. Their temper tantrums were no longer just annoying. They had, quote, temper dysregulation disorder. And so he goes on to just document what's going on as we continue to describe and, uh, diagnoses of diseases and disorders that just, require, just, just describe normal life. Why is that? Well, it's because the DSM is, of course, the gatekeeper to pharmaceuticals, and pharmaceuticals is a multi, multi, multi billion dollar industry. And so the DSM is obviously connected to all of that. As I was thinking about panic and anxiety, I was thinking about do I have this disorder? And yes, indeed, I do. Technical diagnosis requires four or more of the following 13 criteria, and I'll read them to you in just a second, but let me explain the scenario. As I read these criteria, I thought back to a moment in my life where I clearly have this disorder. I, um, I uh, had a, uh, I, I blew, a, blew a knee out in, in uh, playing college basketball, and so I had a knee reconstruction, and I remember this is in 1996, 1997 was the, no, 96 was the, the MRI. And so I went to the University of Chicago, Illinois medical facility, and I go into this medical facility, and there's this thing called an MRI. <laughs> and if you've, ever, if you've ever had an MRI back in those days, you know they don't look like today. You know, today it's just like this tiny little donut thing, and it's pretty, pretty simple. I mean, in 96, this was cutting-edge technology. I walk down into the basement of the UCI medical facility, and there's this thing that looks like some cheap, low-budget sci-fi spaceship taking up this entire room. You kind of open the door, and you're like sliding, you know, this massive thing, and you go around the end. There's this tiny little opening. You get on this table, and they roll you into the, 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 the bowels of this massive machine. And so I had this MRI done in there. It took like an hour, and so then Fast forward uh, until about 15 years later, and so I had some more problems with my knee, and, and, um, and I had to go, they, they prescribed an MRI, and so then I'm sitting there, and I remember two days before the MRI, I got up one morning, I just went, to, you know, I'm going about my day, I'm just brushing my teeth, I'm literally sitting in the bathroom, and I'm picturing that old, cheap, low-budget sci-fi spaceship that I sat in for an hour, and I started panicking. I remembered what it was like, you get rolled like I felt like I got rolled about 30 feet. I mean, the room wasn't even that big. I felt like I got rolled 30 feet into this thing, and then it's just like, it's right there, and my whole body is trapped, and I'm thinking like, what, what if that little conveyor belt thing breaks? And then I'm stuck in there. And then, I mean, they're going to have to disassemble that, that low-budget spaceship and get me out of there. It's going to take days. They're going to be slipping. Where comes another serving of water? And so I'm picturing all of that. I am palpitating, my heart rate is accelerating, I am turning pasty white, I mean, I'm already pasty white. Trembling, shaking, that's three. <laughs> Nausea, abdominal distress, four. 
Light, dizzy, lightheaded, or faint, five. Chills or heat sensations, six. According to the American Psychiatric Association, I only need four of the 13. I pass with flying colors. I got six of the 13. And there I am anticipating an MRI, having not seen an MRI machine in 20 years and not realizing how small they had become, terrified of getting lost in the bowels of this, of this beast. And panic took over. And that's just normal, sinful response to circumstances that I don't like. But I got a diagnosis. And there's a medication for that. That's one of the biggest reasons we downplay anxiety. It's because it's just accepted in our culture. It's accepted as a norm. The rest of these are going to be pretty quick. Number two, ignorance of the sin. If number one is kind of where secular diagnoses and secular psychological thinking are creeping into the church, number two is just flat out a lot of times we are ignorant of what God thinks about anxiety. Jesus says in this passage, do not worry. It's not a suggestion. It's not, a, it's not just a statement. It's a command. If we worry, we are disobeying our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Don't worry. To do so is to sin against God. I, I, I think some people, especially in the, in the Christian um, integrationist movement, are unaware that it's actually a sin. I remember uh, in my undergrad degree, I had to study a lot of psychology, and I remember uh, one time, and this is about two semesters after I was genuinely converted to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I loved the Lord, I was devouring the Word, and I was starting to see that the Bible does not agree with what I'm learning in class. And I walked into chapel, I went to a Christian university, and I walked into chapel, and this psychiatrist presents in chapel a presentation about how psychotropics help you deal with anxiety, worry, and depression. And I remember listening to this person make a case for this is the answer to this problem, and I'm sitting there looking at my Bible thinking, okay, wait a minute, this is a sin, Jesus and Paul prohibit this in the scriptures, and now for 1,900 years, no one's been able to beat the sin until psychotropics come along? It made me want to stand up in the middle of chapel and shout out a paraphrased version of Galatians 2.21, if righteousness came through psychotropics, then Christ died needlessly. Now, we've got to be, we've got to start addressing uh, anxiety and worry biblically. Number, number three we blame it on circumstance. And this is so common. I listed out, a, a whole, I started scratching the surface, but it was a, several categories, several areas of your life that could be potential uh, triggers for you to become anxious or fearful or worried. And it's very natural to blame your anger and your fear and your worry on those circumstances, the very circumstances that caused you to be anxious. I remember counseling one husband who blamed it on his wife. We literally could not meet. We met for three hours in two different settings, and I could not get anywhere but his wife. He was completely embittered and totally anxious and consumed with her flaws and her ills and her sins. I remember one woman consumed in anxiety, blaming it on her veterinarian, whom she accused of outright murdering her dog. And she couldn't get over it, and she was just, in her whole life, her, every interpretation of her, her world was consumed with worry and anxiety because of how she'd been wronged by this um, horrible veterinarian. Whatever we find that are uh, circumstances that cause worry, we're, we're prone to, to blame those circumstances as the cause. And, and of course, we know, as we'll find out in the scriptures, they are not. Another reason we downplay anxiety is number, number four, we blame it on personality. We might imagine that we're just a worrisome type of person. Yeah, you know, I'm, just, I'm just prone to worry. And now, I'm not going to fault anybody for saying that if you're just admitting, yeah, for whatever reasons, uh, my, my, my upbringing, and that affects me, and the way that my mom responded to certain things, that becomes a kind of a natural, I, I get that. There's a pathway. Your sensitivities aren't as high in areas where you've just lived. Um, so there's an element where that's very right and appropriate and biblical to recognize those things. But when we start ultimately blaming it on personality, 
you know, this is very relieving to just say, ah, finally, I can blame it on personality. I know why I'm worried. It's just my personality. It's the way God wired me. I read an article where the person um, discovered that they had panic attack disorder, and this author says, I was, su- I was surprisingly enough relieved, relieved to finally be able to put a name or a label on what was happening to me. And then this author goes down to ask about the panic-prone personalities, and they write, in my quest to find an answer to the question, why me, I began to uncover some interesting data. I discovered that there was a certain set of personality traits shared by people who suffer from anxiety disorders. And so this person looks at their personality, realizes they're prone to anxiety, and voila, there's their solution. Okay, yeah, okay, it's my personality. Got it, that's why I'm anxious. Well, of course, if it's your personality, then that's not something you need to be delivered from. That's something God gave you. Christ didn't come to die for personalities. He came to die for sin. And so until he gets his proper diagnosis, there's no hope in the gospel for anxiety if it is personality. Number five, undiagnosed biblically. We downplay anxiety when it goes undiagnosed Biblically, and now why is that not why is that different than number two? And number two, it just means you're ignorant of what the Bible says about it. Number five, this is probably more closer to home for many of us. What I mean by when we don't diagnose sin biblically, this is when we know it's wrong, we know it's a sin, but we don't diagnose its causes biblically. This is where, this is where I hopefully today becomes a real encouragement and ministry to you ladies. If you already know that, that worry is a sin, but you're struggling with it, and maybe perhaps the sin of anxiety or worry might feel like it's hounding you, and it might feel like it's your front burner sin, and you feel like I don't have power over this at times because the circumstances are too much, too strong, I don't have resources for this, then I pray that this uh, seminar, or really this, this whole day, helps you biblically to be able to diagnose the cause. Because what happens is if you know that this is sin, but you're not equipped to diagnose the cause, it starts to produce despair. And being, being trapped in the sin of anxiety and worry leads to despair, and people start to, fig- start to just doubt their salvation. They start to doubt whether the gospel has any power in their life, and they start wondering, am I going to have victory over this? Am I going to live, a, am I going to live a, a worry-free, anxious-free life? Am I going to ultimately be able to trust the Lord? Or is there, am, am I even in Christ if I can't beat this sin? And so those are reasons why we begin to downplay it. And if you start to downplay it that way, if you start to question whether you really have power over it, you'll either excuse it or you just live with uh, the lack of assurance in in your life that the Lord wants you to have. The Lord wants you to have assurance by seeing that sin uh, killed. Um, Not that you'll never be free of it, but you can kill its power, its dominion over your thinking. So we need to dive into Matthew chapter 6. Grab your Bibles. Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is so helpful here because this is uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is teaching on anxiety in the, in, the, in the paragraph that we're looking at, but I don't want to just look at the paragraph. I want you to benefit from what Jesus is doing in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And so we're going to move really quick. I realize that was a kind of a long introduction. We're actually going to kind of work through this paragraph. It's a lengthy paragraph. We're going to work through it really quickly. It's going to feel like we're just flying through it, like almost like a running commentary. I'm going to show you the outline. I'm going to show you what Jesus is doing here, and then we're going to to, to, to look exactly at, you know, what's so wicked about anxiety at, when, we, when we finish. And once we have the passage in our mind, we'll be able to look back at that and answer that question very appropriately. So to get at this paragraph, let me just make a couple of comments. If, you're, if you've studied the Sermon on the Mount before, it goes from Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7. If you've studied it, you're probably, you're probably familiar with how Jesus teaches here. It's really a powerful sermon. It's the, you might, I don't think it's an understatement to say it's the greatest sermon ever preached. I mean, obviously, the greatest sermon ever preached would be by Jesus, and this is one of many that we have. And this might be the greatest sermon ever preached in the history of humankind. Um, Jesus' teaching model is very clear, it's very repetitive, and it's just absolutely simple. Negative, positive. Negative, positive. Negative, positive positive all the way through the body of this sermon. Why is that important? Because we need to recognize that in this paragraph. So real quickly, just, just for the sake of enjoying this, 
Just let's nerd out for a second and look at what, how Jesus is teaching, because I want, this will actually be helpful for us in the anxiety portion. Go back to chapter 5, verse 21. Notice he says, You have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Okay, that's a, that's a negative statement. He's telling his audience, Here's what you've heard traditionally articulated out of the Old Testament, verse 22. But I say to you, and so he turns around, so he goes from negative to positive. This is the popular exposition of the law, but I'm telling you what. And what's interesting about that is, of course, we're not surprised that what he corrects then is actually truth, and he actually brings the truth to bear on those errors. He speaks truth, but what's, what's unique is he doesn't just start showing them from the Old Testament where they're wrong, he starts quoting this on his own personal authority and saying, here's, here's actually what, what's true. He does that again in 27. You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that even looking at a woman. So the, inter- the popular interpretation is external. He shows how the uh, law actually indicts the heart every single time. 31 and 32 do the same thing with divorce. Um, 33 and 34 with oaths. 35, 38 and 39 um, with law of restitution, lex talionis. 43 and 44 does that with what it means to love your neighbor. He continues, he changes topics. Now he starts looking at the horizontal, the vertical relationship between God and man. And in chapter six, he basically says, don't practice your righteousness before men, but do it so that God in heaven sees what you do. So in, ch- in verse two, don't give this way. Chap- verse three, you should give this way. Verse 7, don't pray this way. Verse 9, you should pray this way. Verse 16, don't fast this way. Verse 17, you should fast this way. So it's negative, positive, negative, positive. Now, here's where we've got to slow down. Everybody look at chapter 6, verse 19. I've got to belabor this paragraph because our text, starting in verse 25, starts with, for this reason. Okay, so when Jesus says, for this reason, in verse 25 through 34, we know that he's actually making a point built on the previous paragraph. So what's the negative positive in verses 19 to 24? Verse 19 is the negative. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Positive. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. Negative, don't store up treasure on earth. Positive, store up treasure in heaven. Now, why does Jesus say that? Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What a powerful statement from Christ. Christ knows, ladies, that Wherever your heart finds preeminent value, that's where your, whatever you value most in life, that's where your heart is going to go. So he's saying, look, if you store up treasure on earth, your heart's going to go that way. All of your life faculties, all your life juices, all of your focus, all of your resources, all of your energy, all of your concerns and burdens are going to be wrapped up in this life. You won't survive that. You will You will squander your life if what you treasure most is in this life. But if you store up treasures in heaven, your heart, your focus, your resources, all of your faculties are going to, and all your concerns and all your burdens are going to center around eternity, and none of those concerns and none of those burdens will be squandered. He goes on to say in verse 22 and 23 that look, whatever your ultimate focus is determines uh, whether you're walking in light or dark, in darkness. Verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And he just says, ladies, look at your soul. Don't picture it like a living room with windows on all sides. Picture it like a cell with one, sun, with one little um, sunlight in the, in the ceiling. And if your focus is on this life, it's like a pitch black sunroof. It's like a window on top that's completely filthy and not letting any light in. How great is the darkness in the soul when your light is focused on this life? However, if your light is focused on eternity, then how great is the light? That's the implication. So verse 24, no one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, 
or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So what does that mean? Jesus knows that whatever you value most, that's where your heart's going to go. And because of that reason, verse 25, because of that reason, he says to us, do not be worried about your life. Don't worry. There's our negative. Our negative is don't worry about this life. That goes from 25 all the way down through 32. And he even repeats it in 31. Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? But then in verse 33, we have the positive. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So ladies, here's a very simple way to think about this paragraph. In light of the previous paragraph, for that reason, you need to do two things. Number one, don't worry about this life, but focus on the kingdom. Don't worry about this life, but focus on the kingdom. So let's just work through these verses very, very quickly. And I, I, I warned you it's going to be fast. In verse 25, he says, don't be worried. And this worried, word worried uh, has the connotation of being apprehensive, of having anxiety, of being anxious or unduly concerned about something. You can actually be concerned about right things, but to be unduly concerned about it is going to cause worry. Uh, it's something that you're really concerned. How well is it going to turn out? Is it going to succeed? It might be out of your control, and you start to see worry. It's something that you attend to. It's something that demands focus. It's something that you care about. You're concerned about something. Those are the meanings of this word translated worry, care, concern. Now, in verse 25, he prohibits that, but he spells out for us a couple of particular categories here. He says, don't worry about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, or, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not your life more than food and your body more than clothing? And so that kind of becomes an outline for this paragraph. In verses 26 and following, he talks about food and then in verse 28 and following, he talks about clothing. So let's just understand. He, he introduces it in 26 with those questions. Is it, is it, is it food? Is it clothing? Is it, is it your sustenance? Is it, is it your possessions? Well, what is your life? What are you concerned about? What's, what's consuming you? What's focusing your, your, your heart with all this attention and worry and care and concern? So the first category, food. Well, let's just look at that. Here's the example. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow nor reap nor gather into barns. You know, I grew up in uh, Kansas, and so I remember, you know, I worked in a grain elevator, and, and uh, you know, I remember uh, every, every uh, uh, the previous season before, the, before the, 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 the crops would grow up, you, you, you have drilling season right after, uh, particularly if it's winter wheat, right after you harvest and then clean your wheat, you have seed wheat, you take that, you drill, and when they drill, they just drag the drills through the, the field, and they're putting, putting the, the seed in the ground. And I mean, they, these farmers have to store this stuff, they have to purify it, they have it certified, and then when you drill it, it's going to sit there and it starts to grow, and then the next uh, following um, spring, it starts to come up, and then you're, 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 you're cultivating it, you're making sure it's irrigated, and then come uh, in, well, in, at my latitude, you know, harvest is usually end of, end of June, depending on how rainy it is, maybe early July. And so then that harvest comes and you run, the combines runs through the field and you, you, you store it all up and you, you load it into a truck, you take it to the grain elevator, you store it in an elevator, and then you can sell it to the market depending on the rising, falling prices, and it's all stored and stockpiled. And there I was, I was working in this grain elevator that stores one million bushels of wheat. I've never seen birds do that. I'm, I'm, I'm still waiting to see like some sort of bird civilization with barns and an economy so they can let out a certain amount of wheat so they can make the greatest profit. I mean, it's like, they don't even think about it. Just, oh, sun came up, let's go get some food. And God provides for them. Now, it's not, the point is not that they do nothing. Like, ah, just, they just sit there in their nest with their remote. <laughs> They do nothing. I mean, yeah, they, they, still, they still go out. There's still activity. Uh, it's, not that it's, it's not that there's lack of activity. It's just that there's lack of worry and concern. In fact, God regularly uses your diligence as means of providing. The issue is not laziness. That's not the point of the birds. They're actually very active. The point is there is no worry or concern. 
they do not have anything stockpiled. They just go out and get their daily worm. And they're not even praying, Lord, give us this day our daily worm. <laughs> they don't even pray. They're just, they just go do it every morning. And, and look, at, look at 26b, yet your Father in heaven feeds them. God feeds birds who don't store, they don't sow, they don't harvest, they don't stockpile, they don't even pray, and God provides for them. And so, are you not worth much more than they? I mean, how profound is that? Birds, just created out of God's sheer delight. And here we are, men and women, created in God's image. Is he not more concerned about our sustenance than the birds? Verse 27 starts to bring into focus the arrogance of worry. And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And the word single hour is, is actually a cubit. And, um, and what that is, is that's the measurement from your uh, mi- middle of your, uh, the top of your hand, of your middle finger down to your elbow. It's, you know, typically uh, estimated at 18 inches. Um, and so what would that mean to add 18 inches to your life? And I think the idea is lifespan. So like, you know, like if you have one of those watches that like keep track of your, your pedometer and you're keeping track of how many steps you, you, you make in a, in a day, you know, and so you're like, oh, I, I walked, uh, you know, six miles today or whatever it was. You imagine how many steps you have in your life? I don't know. Let's just make up a number. Does 50 million seem about right? I don't know. Who knows? Let's just say you walk 50 million steps in a, in a lifetime. Who of you, by worrying, has the power to make it 50 million and one? To add 18 inches to your life? Who of you have that kind of power and ability? Do do you realize the arrogance of worry? Oh, what am I going to do? What are you going to do? I mean, seriously, let's just be honest with ourselves. What are we actually going to do? But it's just my universe and I kind of run. Oh, oh. It's sheer arrogance to imagine the universe rests on our shoulders to think that we could worry and change anything. One study I read said that um, 85% of worries are never actualized. In other words, 85% of the things that we worry about are are absolutely fiction. And uh, and you're thinking, I know. And that's why those 15% are absolutely critical. And how am I going to know the difference on the front end, whether it's the 15 or the 85? (laughs) I get it. I get it. Let's just think about that for a second. Let's say it's one of the 85. Oh, it never actually happened. What a waste. But it's the 15. Okay, so let's just think, let's just think about the 15. Let's say that what you're worried about actually comes true. What did your worry accomplish to avoid it? Zero. Verse 27 already prepares us for an answer of what, what's so wicked about anxiety because one of those has to do with the sheer arrogance of it. Let's keep moving. Verse 28, why are you worried about clothing? So now he picks up the clothing that he introduced in 25b and he says this. Let's just pick another observation. And if, if, if this took place uh, in the traditional site of the sea, uh, at the sea of Galilee, the traditional site of the um, Sermon on the Mount, um, I mean, I've stood on, actually taught a, 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 an overview of the Sermon on the Mount from that spot. It was really sweet. But if you stand on that little hill and there's like a little natural amphitheater and you know, it, the birds and the lilies would have been everywhere. It's just probably, it, regardless if that was the same spot or not, it's probably just right there at hand and Jesus is using these word pictures from what's right there in their, in their view. Consider how the lilies of the field grow. They don't toil, nor do they spin. We could just repeat the same illustration we used for the birds. Uh, I'm still waiting to see a group of lilies with the, you know, shops and clothing and all the styles. And it's just, no, they just, they're clothed. Like God just makes them beautiful. And yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. 
I mean, this is profound. Here you have, now you have, if it's one thing to have birds, which actually have a heartbeat and a brain, now you got lilies. I mean, look at how God gives care to plants to make sure that they are adorned. Verse 30, here's the obvious point. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? I mean, if God feeds birds and he clothes lilies, what, what are we doing worrying about whether he's going to do that for us? This starts to become an assault on God's character. Jesus says, very important, very instructive little phrase here, He's just addressing the audience, and he says simply, you of little faith. It's just an address, and he doesn't, it, he doesn't do anything with it. I mean, it's, it's literally just name-calling, and it's the most edifying use of name-calling you can possibly imagine because Jesus is helping us as the audience to know how to think about ourselves, how to label this, how to diagnose this, you of little faith. What's so wicked about anxiety is it's a lack of faith. We're not taking God at his word. We're not believing he is who he said he is when we worry. So in verse 31, he repeats the prohibition. Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? And this is so, so important. Verse 32 begins with the word for, and he's going to explain why you should never ask those questions in a, from a position of worry. You should never be gripped by worry about such things. Why, Jesus? Why? On what basis can you say that this is totally inappropriate? On this basis, because the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. Jesus makes the point that the pagans... And again, this is before the church, right? So when he says Gentiles, this is not, a, this is not um, some sort of um, genetic issue here. He's talking about people outside of uh, revelation of truth. And so he's talking about people who do not worship Yahweh, people who do not worship the Lord outside the people of God. And so, of course, after Pentecost, the, the, the translation of this very same phrase would be, don't you know that the unbelievers, don't you know that the outsiders worry about those things? He's making a comparison about the inconsistency of a Christian worrying and that being actually more like the atheist. Think about your pagan friends. Think about the people that you're trying to reach. Think about the people in your family who do not trust the Lord, who do not believe the gospel, who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. How do they live? How else can they live except to worry whether their chosen gods and their chosen idols will provide for them? When we, as Christians, worry... We are actually be becoming practical atheists because in verse 32, Jesus is showing us that the pagans worry about those things. And they should because their gods can't provide for them. And as a Christian, now think about the advertising. As a Christian, I mean, here I am. I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor, for crying out loud. You think, what is worry in my heart? What is anxiety in my heart? Tell a lost, dying, desperate world. I'm a preacher of the gospel. I worship the God of Scripture, and he is of no more ability than your idol to provide for my basic necessities. Oh, man, that's, verse 32 is so penetrating. So he says, the Gentiles seek these things, Secondly, I'm saying that because your Father in heaven knows that you need all these things. We've got the Father in heaven. We're worshiping the God who's in charge. We're worshiping the God who gave us life. And ladies, this is an interesting, interesting reality. God gave us life, and he's going to sustain us. And our anxiety and our worry is a lie against God. And so I'm going to read to you a quote. I'm going to read to you a quote here uh, from Lloyd-Jones. And this helps us to expose some of the pride behind our anxiety and our worry. Lloyd-Jones said this about, this about this statement here in Matthew, Matthew 6. What does our Lord mean by this? The argument is a very profound and powerful one, and how prone we are to forget it. 
He says, in effect, take this life of yours about which you are tending to worry and become anxious. How have you got it? Where has it come from? And the answer, of course, is that it is a gift of God. Man does not create life. Man does not give himself being. No one, not one of us, has ever decided to come into this world. And the very fact that we are alive at this moment is entirely because God willed it and God decided it. Life itself is a gift, a gift from God. So the argument which our Lord uses is this. If God has given you the gift of life, the greater gift, do you think he is now suddenly going to deny himself and his own methods and not see to it that life is sustained and enabled to continue? God has has his own ways of doing that, but the argument is that I need never become anxious about it. Of course, I'm going to plow and sow and reap and gather into barns. I'm going to do the things that God has ordained for man and uh, life in this world. I must go to work and earn money and so on. But all he says is that I need never be concerned or worried or anxious that suddenly there will not be sufficient to keep this life of mine going. That will never happen to me. It's impossible. If God has given me the gift of life, he will see to it that life is kept going. But this is the point. He's not arguing as to how this will, done, will be done. He is just saying that it will be. Do we trust him? Do we believe him? To finish our quick exposition of this paragraph, verse 33 is the positive. We need to remain focused. We need to remain focused on the kingdom, on eternity. Verse 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I mean, think about it. If we remain focused on the kingdom, if we remain focused on obeying the Lord, he'll take care of all those details. All we have to do is entrust every concern and burden that pertains to this life to him, leave it in his ability, leave it on his shoulders, put it in his hands where it should reside, and just get busy doing what he's called us to do. If we literally resign ourselves to obedience, there is literally no worry that could possibly dominate our thinking. Get busy focusing on eternity, on his kingdom and his righteousness. Verse 34 then is a conclusion. So then don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I mean, we can worry about tomorrow. We don't even know if we get tomorrow. What a waste of energy that would have been. And if we get tomorrow and we worried about it, we have zero ability to actually change it. So what a waste that would be. So either you get it tomorrow and you wasted your time worrying, or you get it tomorrow and you wasted your time worrying. Either way, you wasted your time worrying. That's helpful. That is so helpful of Jesus to give us this paragraph and to put this paragraph tied directly to verses 19 to 24 because when we are worried about this life, mark it, ladies, when we're worried about this life, we are trying to serve two masters. Our hearts are going down a road that if left unchecked, we will find our our life squandered. You can't serve two masters. You're going to love one and hate the other. And so the more you worry and the more you start taking matters into your own hands, the more you start trying to control your life, the more you start trying to fearfully protect circumstances from happening that you're so terrified of happening, the more you do that, the more you are going to find yourself at odds with God, and then the temptation becomes even stronger to despise God. And this is why anxiety and worry is just so wicked. So here's a list of reasons why it's so wicked, and I already alluded to several of these as we went through it. Um, Well, here it is. And by the way, I'm so grateful for Dave doing the PowerPoint because... um, He was not ready for that. I sprung it on him, and so he's been doing a phenomenal job kind of translating it, uh, the format. We didn't have time to get get it all right. So here's the list. So what's wrong with anxiety just from this passage? Number one, it's arrogant. It's arrogant. You can't control your life. Verse 27 says, Who of you, by being worried, can add a single span to his life? Who can turn your 50 million step life into 50 million point five? Add 18 inches of your lifespan. Who can do that? No one. You are so arrogant. I am so arrogant when I imagine that my worry, that taking matters into my own hands, that relying on myself, 
that trusting in my own ability can change something about my life. I am making myself to be sitting on the throne of God as if I'm in control of this universe. It's sheer arrogance. Number two, it's worldly. It's worldly because it it binds our heart to this world. My anxiety and my worry have never, ever, shocker, made me more eternally minded. Ever. My worry and my anxiety have always made me more earthly minded. It binds your heart to the world. And that's the point of verse 25 saying, for this reason, appealing back to verse 19 to 24, specifically verse 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So when I'm worrying about the things of this life, now my heart juices, my priorities, my focus are getting wrapped up in this world and I'm becoming temporally minded. I'm becoming a worldling. I've taken my eyes off of Christ, off of eternity and off of spiritual truths. If you worry and you give in to worry and you keep feeding it, then Here's why anxiety is so wicked, because every time you do that, you're going to reinforce a lie in your soul. You're going to keep telling yourself, this is actually true. Soul, your life consists only of food, possessions, clothing, temporal comfort, your children's welfare, fill in the blank. So soul, value that. Live for that. And all those things that you've attached your worry and your care and your concern to can get stolen, eaten by moths, and it can turn to dust in your hands. Number three, it's unbelief. And so you saw in verse 30, Jesus says, you of little faith. We start doubting God's word. If we doubt God's word, we're calling him a liar. When God says something in his word, it is a testimony that is fully confirmed. Its righteousness exceeds the mountains. John 3.33 says, He who received his testimony has set a seal to this, that God is true. So when you take God at his word, you're signing your name on the dotted line of a contract saying, God tells the truth. But when you don't take God at his word, 1 John 5.10 says, The one who believes in the Son has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning the Son. So when I doubt God's word, I'm signing my name on the dotted line saying, ah, God's of questionable integrity. We'll talk this afternoon about the example of Sarah, but I just want to give you the example of Abraham. In Romans 4, it talks about him believing God, and God gave him an impossible promise. And if God only gave naturally believable promises, then it wouldn't require faith, would it? So God gives a promise to a man who's almost 100 with a wife of 90 who's been barren even through her childbearing years and tells him, you're going to have a child. And God, and Abraham believed God. He believed in him, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. Abraham could have started reasoning, saying, oh, God said you're going to have a kid. Well, that's impossible. She was barren even when we were at the right age, and now we're not the right age. Doubly impossible. Or you can take God at his word and say, oh, well, this is the God who gives life to the dead, and he calls him to being that which does not exist. So he actually doesn't even need a womb to create a son. He promised. It's true. Okay, I'll have a son. In hope against hope, he believed so that he might become the father of many nations according to what had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. And so with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Isn't that sweet, ladies? You take God at his word and you're giving him glory. You're telling the world, no, he's totally worthy of being trusted. Your, your killing of sinful fear and your killing of anxiety glorify God. It tells to a watching world that know you profess Christ, he's trustworthy. I believe him. So number four, it leads right to number four, it lies against God. The reason why it's so wicked is because you're telling the world that your God is no better than theirs, and that's again from verse 32. 
Gentiles seek these things. Ladies, anxious Christians are a living contradiction. How tragic it would be to say, I worship the God of Scripture, and at the same time, we're practically saying, I'm anxious that things will work out. I'm actually not sure about it. I don't know that God has the ability, or I don't know that God cares. That's what's so tragic about our anxiety. Jesus is so helpful because he kind of, you know, I wanted to start in Matthew 6 this morning because it just helps us, ladies, to kind of set the trajectory for, for today as we look at a few more passages. Um, we're going to look at um, next session, seminar, we're going to look at Luke 10 uh, with Mary and Martha and start to help, you know, get help on um, how worry can distract us from the word. And then we're going to start looking, especially this afternoon, on two passages from 1 Peter on how to kill fear and then how to kill anxiety. But hopefully this helps us to just calibrate our conscience, to make sure that we're, our conscience is sensitive. Like this is, that, this is serious. We cannot be anxious. We cannot be worried. Uh, and so hopefully that's a help. Let's, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for how clear it is because Lord, I know how tenacious the sin of anxiety and worry can be. And for any uh, dear sister here this morning who is plagued by it, I just pray that these sessions would be an incredible encouragement. I pray that it would give hope, that it would give confidence to, uh, to her about you, and that it would put wind in her sails to strive and to win the battle of faith, to repent of lies she's believing about you, and to begin believing what's true, and to walk according to that. I pray that these truths would just absolutely annihilate a stranglehold of anxiety or, or worry on anyone's heart or mind here this morning. Thank you for the power of truth. Thank you for delivering us from ourselves and from our puny uh, tendency to think so wickedly about you and to think so small of your character. And so, Lord, I just pray that your, each passage that we look at today would become a, a ministry to us and it would become food for our soul. In your name we pray. Amen.